Okay, so it's been kind of a while since I've done one of these videos. I think it's about five years. Um, so this might be a little bit rusty, uh, but COVID-19 means that we are moving to much more online learning. Um, so we'll see how we do. Uh, my hands look absolutely terrible because I've been washing them so often and I'm getting them really chapped. You didn't need to know that, but that's why they're not looking very healthy. So we are going to look today at energy stores and energy transfers, the principle of the conservation of energy, and then how we can draw energy transfer diagrams. Now, the first thing to know about is that energy can be put into eight different types of stores. And you need to know these stores off by heart. Now, the stores are, to start with, we've got gravitational potential energy also known as GPE because physicists are lazy and they don't like writing out really long things. So gravitational potential energy is when anything's at a height, so if it can fall. So if something's at a height, it will have GPE. So for example, if I lift this pen up, it's now got GPE because it can fall. The second one is kinetic energy or KE as it's often spelt, as it's often written, because once again, we're lazy. Now, kinetic energy is the energy that anything that is moving has. So it's for moving objects. When I lift the pen, if I then drop it, it will move and it will have kinetic energy. The third one that has initials is EPE, which is elastic potential energy. And that's when something is stretched or compressed and it's sometimes known as strain energy. So imagine if you have an elastic band and you stretch it, you've given it elastic potential energy. Um, five more to go. The next one I'm gonna talk about is thermal energy. Now, all things have got thermal energy because all things do have a temperature. They do have some heat in them, but the hotter something is, the more thermal energy it has. Then we go on to chemical energy. Now, chemical energy is possessed by things that can perform chemical reactions. So, for example, if I have some fuel, I can burn it to release the energy. Um, then, similar to this, but more physically, we have nuclear energy. And that's the, the energy that things have if they can perform nuclear reactions. So it's the energy that's felt in the nucleus of the atom. Um, so I'm going to write nuclear reactions here. So for example, in nuclear fission or nuclear fusion, that's nuclear energy that you're releasing. Then we've got two more. We've got electrostatic and we've got magnetic. Now these are very much linked together. Um, magnetic energy, think about if you've got two magnets that are held together because they're attracting, they've got some energy. It takes work to do to pull them apart. So this will be between magnets. And electrostatic energy is just the same, but between charges. If you've ever noticed that when you rub a balloon on a jumper and then stick it to a wall, it will actually stick, it's because it's electrostatically attracted to the wall. So they're the eight energy stores, and energy can be kept in those eight stores. Then we've got something called energy transfers, and that's how energy goes from store to store. So if it goes from GP to KE, or from thermal to nuclear, that's rare, but if it did happen, it would have to be transferred. And there's four main ways that you can transfer energy. Firstly, there's mechanically. Now, mechanically means that something is moving. So an example of this would be by sound. So if you have sound energy transferring something, um, the particles are moving and vibrating, that's what sound is. Um, and it's also known as by forces. So sometimes you'll, be written, you'll see it written down as it's transferred by forces, and we'll look at that later on. Uh, secondly, there's electrically. And that is if it is connected to a circuit and electrons are carrying the energy or transferring the energy from one store to another. Then we have by heating. Now that's when energy goes from a hot to a cold place to heat that colder place up. And finally, there's by radiation. And when we say radiation here, we specifically mean EM or electromagnetic radiation. Um, the most common example of this one is light. So usually if light is transferring the energy, then we mean by radiation or always to be fair. Now these four things here, these aren't energy stores. You cannot store energy as light. You can't store energy as electricity. You can't store it as heat. 
but you can transfer it that way. Think about it, if you opened a bag, you couldn't have a bag of light or a bag of electricity. It doesn't work, it's too transient, but it can transfer the energy that way. Now we need these two together to think about this thing here, the principle of the conservation of energy, and this is a massive thing in physics. Now you may have heard of it before yourself. The principle of the conservation of energy is that energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transferred from one store or form, people often say, to another. So we can't make energy. Energy was made at the very start of the universe. The total amount of energy in the universe is fixed. It can't go up, it can't go down. What we can do is switch it from form to form. And we can definitely waste it. We can switch it into a form that's not very useful, but we can't actually lose it. And that brings me on to the idea of a closed system. Now a closed system has got two words we need to unpack there. Firstly, a system is just a collection of objects. And a closed system is a collection of objects that can be treated on its own or in isolation. Now, in a closed system, because of the principles of conservation of energy, what we can say is that the net energy change is zero in a closed system. I can't ever have more or less energy. A really big example of a closed system is the universe. So I can't make energy or destroy it. I can't add or take any away. Um, if you have a system where energy increases or decreases and it's not a closed system, think about a car, for example. You put petrol into a car, that's going to increase its chemical energy. That's not a closed system because you've put something into it. Um, but if we think about a closed system, then you can't have an energy change. Now we need to use these and we need to use them in our energy transfer diagrams. And this is quite a tricky part of the um, physics. So for any energy transfer diagrams, you have to think about what the store is at the start. And you often write that in a box. Then you need to think about what the store is at the end. You've got to make sure that these are actually stores and they're not transfers. So you can't have light here, you can't have heat here, you can't have by forces here. The transfer is written along the arrow, like so. This is a very simple one. We'll see when we come to some examples that sometimes there's more than one store, there's more than one transfer. Um, we're going to simplify some of these situations to make them a little bit easier, but generally this is how it works. So we're going to think about a ball rolling down a hill. Now when a ball is up a hill, it's at a height, it can fall. So it starts off with GPA. It's got gravitational potential energy. When it rolls down the hill, it's moving. So that GPE has become kinetic energy. I'm not gonna quite close the box yet. And it's done that because it's moved. And if it's moved, that means we can write mechanically or we can write by forces on the arrow. Now in a perfect world, this is what we just write. But actually when you roll down a hill, there's a pesky little force called friction. And the friction will cause the ball to slow down actually, because some of that energy is not gonna to go to Ke, it's gonna to go to thermal energy of the surroundings and the ball. If I could write Ke and thermal, you could be specific and say Ke of the ball, thermal and K, um, sur thermal of surroundings and the ball. Now, it, this is because of friction. When we do work against friction, that's because of forces. So that also cancels mechanically. Or you could write here, by forces. So it's a little bit trickier than it might first seem. Um, a kettle boiling water. Now I'm going to imagine this is a normal kettle, it's plugged into the mains. Now the mains is an electricity supply, but electricity is not an energy store. So we can't write that in our first box. In our first box, what we actually have to write is Ke. Because electricity is made when, in a power station somewhere far away, a turbine is spun by some kind of usually steam. So that spinning turbine has got kinetic energy and that is what then makes the electricity. So then the transfer is electricity or electrically. And eventually when we're boiling the water, we want the water to get hot, which means we're going to the thermal store of the water. If it's the kettle, it also boil, um, makes the kettle heat up as well. So that would be the thermal store of the kettle. Um, and we don't purely go by electricity here. We'd also have a bit of heat, 
because we're heating up the water and you might get some sound. Okay, that's more of a waste. Um, but you've all, you've all heard a kettle boil, I'm sure. You do get some sound energy there too. Right, next one, shooting an arrow. Now when you shoot an arrow, I'm gonna think about when you hold the bow in its taut position to when the arrow then moves. So when the bow is in its taut position, you've stretched the bow, and so you start with E, P, E. This is quite an easy one, actually. When the arrow is moving, it's moving. So it's got kinetic energy. And the way that happens is that the bow pushes it, so it moves, so we can say mechanically, or by forces. Now, just like up here, where friction gets in the way in the real, in the real world, in the real world, this won't go on forever, so we could also write if we wanted to, and thermal energy of the surroundings and the arrow, um, but I'm gonna keep it simple there for now. Right, a candle burning. Now, when a candle burns, it produces light. We all know that, but light is actually not a store, it's a transfer. So light is gonna go on my arrow. And I would write by radiation or light, either one. So where does that energy come from? Well, a candle produces light through combustion and combustion is a chemical reaction. So we start off with a chemical store. Now, where does that light go? Well, actually, it just ends up around your room and it ends up in the walls of your room, but it's not as light as, not heat, but thermal energy. That candle will slightly heat up the surroundings. Now, if you think about it, candles are warm as well. I put my hand near it, it is quite hot. So it's not just light that comes out of that, there's also heat. So light and heat then turn into the thermal store of the surroundings of the room. Now a torch you'd think is quite similar, and it is to be fair. A torch, I'm gonna consider that it's battery powered. Anything that's got a battery is chemically stored, storing energy, because batteries basically have chemical reactions that make the electrical circuit work. So I'm gonna start with chemical. So that's a good tip. Anytime it's battery, it starts with chemical. Anytime it's the mains electricity, it starts with KE. And for a torch, once again, it's light, it's just like a candle really. So I'm gonna have exactly the same second part as the candle. So I'm gonna have by radiation or light. And actually, a bit of heat. Candle, like, torches don't get as hot as candles, but they get a little bit warm. Um, and it's gonna turn into the thermal energy of the surroundings. Once that light's hit the wall or hit the surroundings, it will heat the surroundings up slightly. Um, this one I quite like, it's a tree, it's a bit random. But think about what trees do, okay, trees grow. And how do they do that? Well, they capture the energy of the sun we talk about through photosynthesis. So the energy that a tree possesses actually originally comes from the sun. And the sun stores its energy, not as thermal energy, but as nuclear energy. Because the sun is powered by nuclear fusion, which is a nuclear process. So we start with the nuclear energy of the sun. And then that is transmitted to Earth as light, so by radiation, or we can write light, doesn't matter which one you do, until it hits the tree. Now, how does the tree store that light? Well, the tree uses the light in photosynthesis to make glucose or to make energy, and that glucose is a form of chemical energy. Think about it, you can burn the tree to produce like a candle effect, not a candle, but a similar thing, or if it wasn't a tree, if it's just a normal plant maybe, you might eat it and then you're gonna use that chemical energy as part of your, well, it'll be, it'll be from your food, so it'll help you to move and to live. So these are quite tricky. Just always think about what's at the start, what's at the end, and then how does it get between those two? If you're not sure, if you can't work it out, the answer's probably mechanically by forces. It's pretty obvious when it's by light or by sound or by heat, um, but the, the forces one's sometimes a bit tricky. Be really careful, check that your stores are actually stores and that they're not transfers and vice versa, that your transfers are actually transfers and that they're not stores. Um, a lot of people like to write light, etc. at the ends here. And just be really, really careful that you know and make sure you really, really know these eight different stores and the four different transfers and you're clear which ones are which and you don't get them confused. So that's energy stores and energy transfers. Next, we're gonna look at kinetic energy and GPE, and then also at work and power. So we'll look at these in a bit more detail. Hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you.